Is this working? 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 Maybe working? Okay. Um, and I give you Professor Michael Carroll. <laughs> so. <clears throat> We're going to start. <clears throat> Good morning, Global Congress 2018. <laughs> Welcome to American University Washington College of Law, where this first Congress was hosted in 2011. And we are thrilled to have everyone back and new faces in the movement uh, in 2018. Um, I would like to introduce my colleague Susan D. Carl, who is our Vice Dean and representing the school in welcoming you and opening this uh, fifth annual Global Congress on uh, Intellectual Property and the Public Interest. Uh, Professor Carl teaches and writes about civil rights legal history. She has a wonderful book uh, that I recommend to you. She also teaches about employment discrimination, labor and employment law, legal ethics, and the history and sociology of the legal profession. Uh, her book is Defining the Struggle, National Organizing for Racial Justice, 1880 to 1915, published by the Oxford University Press in 2013. In 2014, she received the Organization of American Historians Liberty Legacy Award for the author of the best book by a historian on the civil rights struggle from the beginnings of the nation to the president, present. Um, and also, can we give Peter Maber a quick hand for the musical intro opening? <laughs> All right. I'll be back to provide some more thanks, but at the moment, Susan, please let, kick us off. Hello, everyone. I've just had a few minutes to get to meet some of you, and what an amazing collection of people. I am so excited. Um, I do write about social movements and so at public interest and, and justice, and so this is, you're like my people, and I just have been thrilled to be here. But I am not here in my capacity as a scholar and teacher. I am the newly appointed vice dean of the law school, so I spend my days now doing administration. Um, and I am here to bring a very hearty welcome uh, from our dean, Camille Nelson. Uh, Camille Nelson is a... Uh, a scholar uh, in also in the area of justice, equity, parity, fairness, disability law, uh, civil rights, uh, anti-discrimination law, um, and she has a deep and passionate interest in law and technology. Unfortunately, today she is fundraising. I think, ironically, among like high tech industry types <laughs> in New York City. Um, and of course, as dean, she often cannot be at events at WCL, and that's always disappointing to her. But not being able to be here for this particular event was especially disappointing to her because her passion lies right in the intersection of law and technology and public interest and justice issues, and that's what you all do. And she recognizes that and wanted me to express her her deep disappointment not to be able to be here. She hopes to run into all of you in other settings or at um, future Congresses. Um, so uh, just a, a little bit about WCL. Um, we are, under Dean Nelson's leadership, all passionately interested in the field that you are working on, on this project of building systems for justice and legal accountability and law uh, in the high-tech internet intellectual property space in the 21st century. Uh, and we deeply believe that we need to train our students in that project. Um, I hope many of you who run organizations will think about possibly having our students as interns. I've already been hitting some of you up <laughs> as I've met, uh, met you. Um, I just wanted to tell a very brief story about something that happened two days ago in our law school. We had a faculty discussion about teaching about, not teaching with technology, but teaching about law and technology. We had more than 60 faculty members in the room and various statuses and types. Every single one of them is involved in some way in teaching about law and technology in this rapidly evolving multifaceted field. 
Um, we have an amazing faculty in that respect. You know a number of them. Uh, you know Christine Farley, who I have always admired for putting a finger on this field that I didn't believe could exist of intellectual property and gender and really naming it and expanding it and starting a conference here that really put that field on the map. An amazing, amazing accomplishment and an endeavor. Michael Carroll, who is the one of the founders of the IP program here, involved in thousands of boards and public service and public interest activities um, and full of intellectual inspiration at the law school in all kinds of ways. Sean Flynn, who's at least for as long as I've known him, which has been about two decades, something like that, sure. a decade and a half, has been <laughs> pioneering the access to medicine space and all kinds of other things and running our Pidget project that I'm sure all of you already know about. Uh, we had people at our faculty discussion a couple of days ago, like Louis Grossman, who was talking about uh, IP technology and medicine and teaching about that and really, really deeply involved in that. And I could go on and on. Jen Daskal, who is now teaching a course called Cyber Flashpoints. Not sure what that means, but she co-teaches with somebody who's an engineer um, and is a brilliant, I think, internationally at this point recognized scholar. She's just a junior scholar, but she is um, publishing up a storm in the area of privacy, internet, national security, and I could go on and on, but we have, you know, a wonderful faculty um, teaching in this space and related spaces, um, and hopefully some of them are floating in and out. So I just wanted, um, in closing, to welcome you again on behalf of the Dean, um, to invite you to be a frequent visitor here and to hopefully think of WCL as a, um, a home for your thought work uh, in the uh, area of public interest and, and uh, intellectual property. Thank you very much. Can I move it? Is that okay? Oh, hi. God, this microphone makes me feel so short. This and this. Hello, good morning. How is everyone? I'm Christine Farley. I'm one of the faculty members um, who teaches IP here, and I co-direct our program on uh, intellectual property information justice. Uh, I uh, am delighted uh, to be able to be one of the people who welcomes you here today, and I don't want to take up too much of the, the time we have. Um, but I want to point out something that we may all be thinking about, um, which is that um, the eyes of the world are on Washington, D.C. today. And that's because we are live streaming these proceedings. Um, <laughs> there, in other news, um, there is a grand finale, um, a, a, a season finale, um, being, uh, being live web, uh, broadcast as well down the street. Um, so I just want to point out that you could all do the world a favor um, by helping the world um, keep track of both events um, by live tweeting our proceedings. Uh, and you can do so with hashtag GCIP18. Thank you very much. I'm not sure which will get more tweets, but um, we'll, we'll watch that space. Um, so we here at American University Washington, Washington College of Law are delighted to welcome you to the fifth Global Congress on Intellectual Property and the Public Interest. Um, in fact, it all started here in 2011, and we are really proud and honored to be hosting the Global Congress for the second time. And I want to point out that that is no random fact that, that we have hosted twice, um, because it's really in the fiber of what we do, and I think um, uh, Dean Carl alluded to this in many ways. Um, you may have heard that our law school was founded by women um, to provide education to women at a time when they were um, refused admission from other law schools. And the mission of Access to Justice remains um, our mission today. Um, public interest law is, as we would say in this field, our total look and feel. 
Uh, you can see it in our people and our faculty and our staff and our students. You can see it in our curriculum and what we teach. Uh, and you can see it in our programs. And to name just one program, our program, um, I want to recognize my colleague Peter Yazzie. So long before we ever thought to attach the word program to IP, we had Peter Yazzie. And Peter Yazzie was IP at American University. And long after we attached the word program to IP, Peter Yazzie is IP at American University. And if you think about it, because you know Peter, it was inconceivable that we would do IP at American University without focusing on the public interest. So that was inevitable. And I think one of the reasons we've been able to grow uh, so robustly over the years is because that focus on public interest and IP has been so attractive to so many people and to so many organizations that it has enabled us to collaborate with all of you. So uh, we, are we, we think of this as a celebration of our common values, and we're delighted to have you all here um, to celebrate with us. Um, I haven't mentioned the global part of the Global Congress, um, which is also a natural fit for us. Um, maybe it's because we're located in Washington, um, but I think it's probably more to do with the fact um, of our people again. Uh, we at American University have never forgotten um, to consider global implications of policy and law, um, especially in the field of intellectual property. And we would never um, want to consider only a subset of questions having to do with intellectual property. Um, so all of this is a very long-winded way of saying, we love this shit. <laughs> so we are totally happy. We are totally pumped to have you here. Um, during your stay here, if you can think of any way that we can make this better, come and see us. Um, but we are delighted to have you, and we're ready to do this. So thank you very much. All right. Um, so why are we here? What, what is it that binds this community? What, what is it that, that, that we have? Um, you know, IP is supposed to promote the public interest on its own. Why do they need us? Um, well, you know, we're reality-based, pragmatic people who understand that we want to help the fields of intellectual property, of information law, actually achieve the goals that we say they are designed to do, because we see many places where they don't. Um, and we faced a couple of setbacks, right? Uh, the recent uh, decision in, in the EU to uh, work against the public interest in certain ways requires further work on our part. Um, a Brazilian copyright law that did not uh, encourage the digitization of the cultural heritage uh, now means that a, a museum and much of uh, that important cultural heritage will, is beyond our reach at this point. Uh, but we have to keep fighting. We have to keep telling the story of the public interest. And part of what uh, I love about working with all of you is the, the, the generosity of spirit. So part of what brings us together, part of what I think animates our work is the generosity of spirit. Not only is willingness to collaborate across, uh, across time zones, <laughs> across continents, with each other, um, but really why, what is it we're trying to do with access to medicines, with access to education, it, it is animated by a feeling uh, that there are other people who need our help, that we have some level of expertise, some level of commitment and, and resources that we need to direct towards making this a more generous world, a more uh, an inclusive world when it comes to information resources and innovation. Um, and that generosity of spirit then also uh, is the way we express ourselves with each other. We didn't do a formal conference code of conduct because it's implicit in the way that we uh, all deal with each other. It has always been the way that we deal with each other it, out of that generosity of spirit. Um, and so I do think it's a fundamental value that informs this community. Um, and in that spirit of generosity, there is also uh, gratitude. And it, it's at this point I want to express some of that gratitude. We normally wait to thank sponsors and staff and all of the people who made this possible at the close. But because of the 
uh, organic nature of this meeting with lots of moving parts and things, uh, we may not have the opportunity to focus our gratitude uh, later in the meeting. And so we want to take this moment now at the outset to acknowledge all of the hard work. We sat down a year ago looking at the calendar saying, where can we do this? So my first point of gratitude is in 2011, we had a hurricane. So I'm thankful we had a little rain, but we don't have a hurricane. Um, okay, so there are many, many people to thank uh, in, in order to let us uh, be here. Um, love can take you only so far, but at some point you need money to make a meeting like this happen. <laughs> um, uh, and we had very generous uh, generosity of spirit, but generosity of resources from longtime funders. When other funders have flirted with this space and then been driven out or have left for various reasons, but there are others who've stuck with us in the work we do, understanding its long-term impact. I want to uh, thank the Open Society Foundations, Melissa. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> IDRC, Boston, there. Um, we have uh, uh, Ford. No. Uh, okay, sorry. But, so, but OSF, uh, Ford, and IDRC have been uh, the sort of backbone supporters, um, as well as uh, a number of other supporters. In fact, uh, for the benefactors, we had CCIA host a wonderful reception a rooftop recession, uh, reception very close to the White House. People might have been tempted to express their views, uh, but they did not throw stones or do anything else to <laughs> take advantage of their proximity. Thank you. Um, Microsoft hosted us last night for a really uh, exhilarating discussion of artificial intelligence and intellectual property, um, and we're very uh, thankful for their generosity in, the, in that sponsorship. Uh, the law firm of Stern Kessler is a major uh, patent firm with a generic medicine clientele that has created a human rights program that has assisted many of the advocates in this room. Um, and Fenwick, the, the Fenwick law firm, Silicon Valley, uh, home of Andrew Bridges, who's long been a stalwart in this community uh, and, and fighting for users' rights and copyright um, in major litigation that has set precedents that, that upon which we've been able to build. Um, if you received a partial scholarship or registration to this meeting, could you raise your hand? Could you please now thank the sponsors who provided the funding for that? <laughs> the only way the Global Congress works as a face-to-face -face meeting is if, if we have the resources to pay for the travel support needed to bring everyone together. And our sponsors understand the value of our togetherness as being something that has follow-on benefits over and over. And so we really need that sponsorship in order to make a meeting like this work. Uh, and thank you so much for that. Um, we also have um, uh, uh, publication sponsors. The Intellectual Property Brief here at the uh, law school is a student-edited publication, as is the American University International Law Review, both of whom are uh, cooperating with us in, publicate, in publishing some of the scholarship and, and research that is being presented during the meeting. Um, and we have a number of people who made this happen. So we sat down a year ago starting to plan, um, and it takes a village to put on a meeting like this. So we, of course, have other organizations that we've collaborated with. Um, but because we were the host institution, we understood that we needed to carry a lot of the weight in terms of making this happen. Um, so I first want to recognize Sean Flynn as the sort of chair of this three ring circus. Um, um, and Meredith Jacob and Mike Palmetto, where are you? Yeah. yeah. Our, our, um, and then we really put together a team of people who, who really had to uh, make this meeting a day to day project. So Andres is where Andres is there. <clears throat> Zhao, one of our students, is in the back. William, another student. They might still be working. 
Valerie, Jenna, and Jackoff have all been, that was the core team. Like day to day, I have to get up. Is the Global Congress going to happen? Yes, I'm going to make it happen, right? Um, and then Jezeline, um, Andrade, and Sarah Showquist, uh, they're out working hard, but they've, they've done all of the, how do we make this work? How do we get the travel reimbursed? How do we make all that happen? Um, and Sarah stepped into a role that was previously occupied by Gidget Benitez, who left us at the end of the summer, but who worked with us over the year, and so we can't uh, not acknowledge all of the contributions she made. Um, so thank you all for being here. We're so excited. Um, and in the spirit of generosity and gratitude, I'm now going to turn it over to Sean uh, to finish the closing and get us started, because we got a lot of work to do. <laughs> Thank you. And this is just the, uh, the beginning, not the closing. And let me just pull up. Bear with me for a moment. I just put together a couple stats. And... Mike just mentioned that we forgot to thank one more benefactor, which was Google, who's actually supported this space since the first Global Congress. The Global Congress in 2011 followed on the heels of a series of efforts to engage in what was then the enforcement agenda that we were resisting. And they were one of the prime organizations to actually step in and fill a space that had been created by an exodus of funders in this area. And they've remained there. So a lot of us are thankful for having that extra resource. Um, and I will just say, as with all of our corporate funding, um, we sign agreements to only accept that money as gifts and to not, uh, to not affect the agendas of what we do. And so far, we've been able to partner with a very small number of corporations that are willing to accept that. So we're happy to have uh, Stern Kessler and Fenwick join join that group this year as, as one of a small number of law firms not conflicted out of working with the Global Congress. Um, so I wanted to say um, a little more about who we are and why we're here and give you a little bit of background about what the Congress is about. And then I'll turn it over to our other track leaders and then to Joe Karaganis, who is orchestrating our polis platform, a vehicle for continuing to express ourselves in this community, both with those who are not physically here um, and in the room in the sessions when you're not speaking out formally. Um, so who, who are we and, and why are we here? So it was, it was seven years ago last month uh, that the Global Congress on Intellectual Property and the Public Interest was launched uh, at American University. As Mike mentioned, it was in the, uh, it was directly before a large hurricane which hit us directly. <laughs> and so we drafted that final declaration in the midst of, of wind swirling outside. It was in the wake of a small and very erratic odd earthquake so it was in that kind of moment between a literal tremor of the earth and a huge swirling storm that we crafted the Washington Declaration on Intellectual Property and Public Interest. Now, so if you were there at the first Global Congress in 2011, can you please stand up so we can see who you are? OK, so thank you for coming back and being part of this community from the very beginning. And the rest of you all are either new to this endeavor or relatively new. So we have over 400 registered participants. Not all of them woke up early enough to be here today. <laughs> we will steadily grow as we get more towards the lunch hour. And we'll grow even more tomorrow. So tomorrow will be kind of the pinnacle. We'll probably have around four or 500 people around in this building, including all the students who refuse to register, right? Um, so of those, about 120 are members of the Congress. They have been to at least one other global Congress. And they have elected to remain on our membership list and receive communications and be part of the global Congress community. 
the overall community now stands at about 850 members of the Global Congress. Those are people who attended at least one of the Congresses in the past and have elected to remain engaged in the Congress as members of that community. And so those people that stand, that stood up, you know, keep eyes on them. And if you're new to this, please introduce yourself, talk to them. Those are your leaders to kind of bring you through what we're doing today. As you probably noticed, this is not a normal conference. So the idea of this Congress, a word that we picked very consciously, is to really provide the substance for the gathering and continuation of what I think is really a movement. A gathering of people working together, finding common spaces, finding collaborations to push a common agenda, combining the research with the activism in order to promote common goals. And we've expressed those common goals in our Washington Declaration on Intellectual Property and the Public Interest, which is linked on the main conference page, and expresses what we then cataloged as our goals and ideals of that moment in 2011. And so one of the tasks of the Congress every year is to revisit that. So if you have not read it yet or recently, please spend some time this morning looking through some of the objectives that we outlined then and identify where we've had achievements. So there's some of the things on that list that we've actually accomplished. So yesterday, the United States ratified the Marrakesh Treaty on the Blind. Right. So if you recall back in 2011, that was one of the specific objectives of the limitations and exceptions provisions within the Washington Declaration, is that A, we wanted to have enforceable minimum standards on limitations and exceptions in international law. And specifically, there was a call for a treaty, a binding treaty on providing access for people with disabilities. And we did not define it at the time to be restricted to only the blind or people with visual impairments. And so that part of the agenda remains, and that part of the agenda is still on the agenda at WIPO, and we're still pushing for it. We also called for, in that moment, um, new, uh, new and expanded uh, international minimum standards on libraries. And I see Teresa Hackett is back in the corner and many other members of the libraries and archive communities that are still pushing on that agenda today, which is moving forward. We called for, in that document, expansions of protections for education and research. And that's an agenda at WIPO right now. And there's a new coalition that's, that's really been formed since the last Global Congress that is pushing that agenda in WIPO and other places right now. In fact, at the pre-Congress activities for the user rights working group, we drafted a declaration, which we'll be releasing today at 4 PM, pushing governments to move forward on that agenda, to move forward with a treaty in WIPO, and to take a series of specific actions, more specific than we got in the Washington Declaration, about how to move that agenda forward. And I encourage you all to come and to consider joining that statement, which will remain um, open through and after the Congress, and that we'll use to push forward the agenda in the World Intellectual Property Organization um, next week, and then when it meets formally later this month. So this is, a, this is a place for incubating ideas, but it's also a space for incubating action. And so I, I think, it, to me, this is really probably the most unique convening in its attempt to bring these two communities, the research community on the one side and the advocacy community on the other, together in a conscious effort to foster collaboration and partnership um, in these areas. So that, that's kind of who we are and what we're working on. So who we are in the room, where we're from, is, is actually a particularly interesting element. So if you look around, I think you'll notice we're an incredibly international crowd. Actually, over 50% of the people at this Congress are not from the United States. Right. So it's a truly global Congress. There are some winners among you. So um, 
we have six countries with more than 10 delegates. And I think you can see in those countries that they are places where a lot of the action in this movement is happening. So Brazil, you win. <laughs> you should have had one more. In fact, we might have uh, counted uh, Marcos Wasovic, who deserves a special call out for, I think, being the academic in the room that has sent the most young researchers and advocates to this Global Congress. So thank you, Marcos, and Abstentia. <laughs> Missed his plane flight from Germany yesterday and could not actually get here in person as he was intending to do. Um, India, 17 people. Canada, 16 people. South Africa, 14 people. Think a little bit how far it is to get here from South Africa. And they made the top four list. OK, United Kingdom, etc. This whole list is all with more than five from that area. And then you can keep going down. You know, Chile, Ethiopia, we have three people here from Ethiopia, three people here from Uganda, three people here from Ukraine, China, Finland, Israel, Italy, Jamaica, Kenya, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, South Korea, all have at least two people from those countries here. And then there's a series of others that have at least one. There's 54 countries represented at today's Congress. So thank you all for coming from literally around the world. Our history, of course, is an essential part of who we are. Uh, I mentioned that in 2011, we came together to re-articulate the public interest dimension in intellectual property. Those are the words we used. That's the first line of the Washington Declaration. And those words were chosen carefully. And because we recognized that although this particular convening started in 2011, it wasn't the first time this community had gotten together. It wasn't the start of our relationships. It wasn't the start of our political projects. There were many other different formulations that not only came before us, but that we drew inspiration on in formulating the means and the ends of the Congress. So, the, the original Congress organizers, which included is, is Pedro Mizukami here. Pedro Mizukami, who was then at uh, CTS at FGV, and Joe Karaganis, who's sitting close by with American Assembly, myself from PIDGIP, and um, two uh, others from IDRC met at a table on the top floor of a hotel looking over the ocean in Rio. And thought to ourselves, we feel relatively successful in kind of taking down the enforcement agenda. There was a series of research efforts that came out. You know, Some of them were put in the Media Piracy and Emerging Economies report, which was incredibly successful in kind of taking away the evidence base from the enforcement agenda. And then there was a huge mobilization that occurred through, but not only through this group, that was worldwide that ultimately defeated what was then the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement, the massive vote against it in Europe, and a refusal of every other country but Japan to submit the final document for ratification. But that victory felt very hollow. When your definition of winning is the status quo, it doesn't keep you moving in the same direction. And so the discussion at that table was, how do we do something different? How do we re-articulate? How do we re-energize the public interest dimension that should and always really has been motivating this field? And so the idea was to reconvene that group to invite the same people who were working with us on the enforcement agenda and invite them all to come forward and work explicitly on formulating what we then call the positive agenda. Come to the table with your ideas about what we should be working for instead of what we should be working against. And as I mentioned, we weren't the first to have those ideas. We were trying to return to something that had existed before. But that little group, I would consider us kind of the second generation in this movement. 
We had predecessors who had been setting the stage before us for many, many years. So I think we brought some new energy, but we weren't necessarily bringing wholly new ideas. And a lot of the people who are really our elders and our forefathers and mothers in that movement came to the first Global Congress and are here for this Global Congress. Um, people like Peter Yazzie, we mentioned, people like Pam Samuelson, Jamie Love, Carlos Correa, Jerry Reichman, Susan Sell, Fred Abbott, Neva Elkin-Koren. All these people are here now. And all these people were doing public interest IP policy before it was cool, kept doing it when it became not cool, and are now here doing it when it's hopefully cool again. So thank you to all of you for kind of being our elders and our inspirations. We had inspirations of different kinds of meetings and convenings. There's the various convenings in Bellagio, which tended to be smaller, but had a similar objective of bringing together advocates and academics and researchers. There was the Yale ISP project that for several years hosted the A2K conferences and gave rise to the A2K treaty and some other uh, important framing and research lessons. Um, there were a series of other um, movements and convenings and, and advocacy uh, uh, efforts that, that, that informed what we wanted to do. And our main objective was to do it bigger and to do it in a more sustainable fashion and to keep doing it and not letting it go away. So that was in 2011. We went to Brazil after that and had our next Congress in Rio. We went to South Africa after that, had our next Congress in Cape Town. We went to India after that, had our next Congress in Delhi. And now we're back, we've come full circle. We've proved that we can make at least one cycle. And our challenge is to continue doing that cycle forever, <laughs> right? Our issues aren't gonna go away. We're gonna continue needing this forum. And as Joe has said on several occasions when we were kind of planning this convening, we have to create it because if we don't, someone else will have to create it because we need this. We need this space to come together and collaborate and many important things have come out of it. Now, I know there's a tendency in this group to focus on our losses because the losses mount up day after day. But I just want to point out and encourage you to think about our wins. As I mentioned, in 2011, we called on WIPO to pass a treaty to promote and protect access to copy where I works for people with disabilities, and we have one now. In 2011, we called for countries to require open access policies for government-funded works. Just this year, Brazil enacted such a policy. In 2011, we called for an end to free trade agreements and other international laws that lengthen copyright and patent terms. And although there's been a lot of efforts, I don't believe a single agreement has passed since 2011 that has lengthened copyright or patent terms. In 2011, we called for consideration of open-ended exceptions to copyright that operate like the Fair Use Clause and provide a general public interest exception to copyright protection. And South Africa is on the cusp of enacting such a right possibly as early as next month. In 2011, we called for using competition and other consumer protection tools to battle excessive pricing and patent abuse. And here we'll hear an excellent panel from UNDP, which took up that charge, created a project, and is doing that around the world right now. We've accomplished more, and I want you to reflect upon them and help us make that list, and, and let's report them back at the General Assembly. But I want us to focus on those kind of elements that we've achieved as we think forward to what we can achieve forward in the future. Let me make... Um, just a couple comments on the means and ends of the Congress to make sure people know a little bit of what we're doing, because some things are slightly, slightly different than years past. Um, so first, we've got three major tracks or pathways or focus areas. So generally, broadly, the Congress is constructed around all issues around copyright and access to knowledge and the knowledge economy on one side and patents in the innovation economy and promoting innovation on the other. But within those, we have three particular groups that we had funders support and that we're concentrating more particularly on. And that includes copyright user rights, access to medicines, and digital trade. And we'll hear from people explaining um, each of those uh, sectors in a moment. Let me describe a little bit um, is my dual role as kind of chair of the overall Congress, but also chairing the User Rights Committee, 
a couple elements of what we're doing in the user rights committee, and then I'll turn it over to the others to, to define the other tracks. So as I mentioned, the user rights group has been meeting over the last several days. We started meeting on Tuesday, had meetings on um, affecting international law and affecting domestic policy, and we'll be releasing a declaration on education and research today at 4 p.m. that we encourage you to come and support. We're doing a couple other interesting things too. I believe uh, starting this afternoon, there's gonna be a hackathon for people to map the openness and flexibility of limitations and exceptions in their copyright law. So please stop by there and fill out a short survey and contribute to a tool that we'll be releasing that Douglas is designing on a wiki platform and will release at the Global Assembly on Saturday afternoon. Uh, we have a movie series. So on Saturday, there'll be a series of, of copyright and intellectual property focused movies in the ceremonial classroom. It includes uh, Emmy Award winning documentary filmmaker Rihad Desai, the producer of The Big Debate South Africa, Ben Cashton, and several other filmmakers who have come and agreed to share their films with us to help um, spot, you know, trigger our ideas and carry us forward on how to present these ideas to the general public. And, um, and I'm gonna stop there. So I think, I think those are some of the things to highlight. And I welcome you, and I thank you for coming. I think this is going to be an incredibly exciting Congress. You should give up your idea. You're going to go to everything you want. But we are videotaping a large number of the programs so that you can see them later. And that's your warning on that. You are now in the public part of the Congress. So every public panel discussion and every public TED Talk may be recorded. So we're recording as many as we can. We can do four at any given time. So if you're in any of those, you should assume you're being recorded and act appropriately. If you're in a workshop, we will not be recording you. So the difference between a panel and a workshop is that the panels are public and on the record, and the workshops are Chatham House rule, which means you cannot attribute anything you hear to an individual person. You can trade ideas, but you cannot trade attributions. And in a workshop, anyone at any moment may go off the record to prevent you from even sharing the idea. Okay, so those are the distinctions between the public and private parts of the program. And with that, I think, oh, a couple other, I have to remind you. So um, we will be ending every session promptly on time, especially today, because we're sharing this facility with students who have to come to class. So if you have a 50 minute session, your session goes for 50 minutes, okay? Uh, at times, there will be nothing going in the room after you, and then you're welcome to linger, but you should stop at exactly your stopping point so that people can go to next sessions. As you'll see from the agenda, it's very cramped, and we've tried to schedule things with like things in rooms that are close by, but we need to allow people to go. So we will have timekeepers in rooms. Uh, students here will be keeping time and keeping us on schedule. And then the final moment is that, um, we also don't have huge staffs of cleaners to clean up after you, so please pick up your trash and bring it outside when you're done with the room, and that'll make everything go more smoothly. Did I get everything? Okay. This is being filmed. Yeah, I mentioned every session is subject to being filmed. Okay, so now I'm going to bring up our panel of track leaders and allow our panel of esteemed colleagues to sit or move if they like. But so Matt Kavanaugh has been heading our Access to Medicines group, and Berju Killick has, has been running our Digital Trade group, and whichever one you'd like to go first, and Joe will be last. Hello, everyone. I'm not as tall as Sean Flynn, it turns out. How's it going? Not bad so far? All right, so I'm Matt Cavanaugh, um, and thank you all for being here um, at the Global Congress. We are really excited to have so many folks here in the room. And as Sean said, uh, the number of people that are flying in over the next six hours is really dramatic, right? And so thinking about this kind of community that's coming together to think boldly about intellectual property, um, but also about kind of how that affects people's lives is, is really inspiring. A few thank yous on, on my behalf, right? So a big thank you to the Open Society Foundations for support, especially to get folks here from around the world. That's been incredibly important. And 
and a big thank you to Peter Maberduke and the colleagues at Public Citizen. Um, over the last several days, folks at Public Citizen have been engaged in a whole set of workshops, taken folks to the Hill, done a workshop on trade that's really um, kind of bringing a bunch of the advocacy and activism into the room right now that's incredibly important. Um, so, so where are we? It's 2018. And I think it is unquestionable uh, that the number of calamities, at least as somebody living in the United States of America, um, continue to pile up, right? And at times, I have to say, it is hard to figure out why we should be at a global congress for intellectual property, right? Is this the thing that matters? Is this a thing that matters? But I just came back from New York, and apologies that I missed the first two days of, of amazing activities, uh, because I was up in New York for the uh, UNGA meetings um, around tuberculosis. Now, tuberculosis, UNGA, these are not the most exciting things either, I will admit, right? But it was deeply uh, and intensely moving to be spending time with colleagues um, in New York from around the world who are facing TB every day. And it reminded me just how much um, the issues that we work on matter in real life. So that if, for example, you are diagnosed with TB today, you can expect that the core medicines that you're going to be taking are going to take six months. And they're going to be nasty, and they're going to have lots of side effects. But if you happen to have drug-resistant tuberculosis, you're going to take a whole other set of medicines that are going to take two years. 15,000 pills, daily injections, and there's still only about a 50% chance that you will be cured. That's today. That's innovation in medicine, that's access today. And even with that, those drugs are likely to leave you deaf with lung damage. And as Timpiani from Kenya, who was sp speaking at the UN meetings, reminded us, it's likely to leave you deep in poverty. Because in fact, not working, not being able to be up, having to go daily to a clinic means not being able to make money for your families. And it likely means that you're going to have to decide whether or not to buy food for some people, right, or to buy medicine for some people. This is not what should be happening in 2018. And it can be often difficult to figure out how does intellectual property come into all of our daily lives. But it was deeply moving to stand there with colleagues and remember exactly how it comes into our lives. Because the fact that we've got two new drugs for tuberculosis in the last 50 years is not an innovation system that's working for people. TB is the leading cause of death of people of infectious disease around the world. It's not a small market. 10 million people every year get TB, right? So as we talk about market failures, we should, of course, be thinking about drugs, diseases like this. And yet we've had two new drugs. They're called Zalaminid and Bidoquilin. And only about 12% of people who need it immediately, right now in the world, have it. Immediately, 12%. So something's wrong, right? Why is it? Well, it's because TB still affects the poor, mostly. And it's because our R&D system is based on linking price and research and development together. Right? It's based on this long tail economic model that says that there's no market for a disease in which 10 million people get it every year, in which over a million people die every year. The incentive systems are broken. But we've been here before, right? And we know that there are alternatives to this. And in fact, the colleagues in this room have been central to creating the ideas that push back against the principle that says that actually the intellectual property system and the, the principle around profit motives is actually the only way forward. And I think increasingly what we are seeing are alternatives that are creative, that are interesting, that are inspiring, that are changing the models that we've got out there. Um, Sean encouraged us to think about some, some, some places that we've won, right? So, so here's a few. Amidst all of the negative pieces on access to medicines, this year, blockbuster drug, Delategrier, to fight HIV, was introduced in generic form for $74 per patient per year. Not $100,000, not $74,000. I think you might have not heard what I said. $74, right? Um, and that transformation, that transformation is because of creative models and power of people that have pushed back against the systems that exist and said there are better ways to be doing it. Other wins, right? 
the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, right? Thinking about what was discussed at the Global Congress. I have to say, how many of you were at a Global Congress as the TPP was being negotiated and thought there was no way it was not going to go through in the form that it was in? Who here was involved in negotiating the TPP? Raise your hand. At least several of you, right? And do you know what didn't happen? What didn't happen is the TPP did not go through as currently planned. Now, perhaps that has to do with the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue a little bit, right? But it also has to do with the strength of the, of the capacity of movements that were here, governments that were smart, uh, folks that were doing smart, powerful advocacy um, and research to make it actually happen. So, and then one other kind of win I should mention, right? So raise your hand if you're involved in the South African Fix the Patent Laws campaign, right? So colleagues, right, who are in the room, who birthed things that got support from folks here at the Global Congress that transformed the way things happen, the South African government has tabled a new policy, and it is transformational, and we are seeing the ability to actually change patent laws. So what's going to happen this week? One thing, right, we know that this intersection of scholars and activists matters quite a bit. And so there's a variety of panels that I won't go through. You can read them all, right, but on gene therapy, on patent challenges, on new business models for R&D, on licensing, on diagnostics, on LDCs, on campaigning for change, on the history of how we make, uh, make things, things happen, and a variety of TED Talks, right, um, which are going to be fantastic. Uh, several of you in the room, I think, are giving your first TED Talk, and I am so excited to hear them. Um, so thank you for that, right? And this follows on several days of work around empirical uh, evidence that was done, and thank you to Deb Gleason and colleagues for putting together the FDA's panel, we'll hear a little bit about that, about generating the evidence that we need that will matter long term about the impact of free trade agreements as it relates to this. And then the final thing that I want to flag for you tonight is that at 6 p.m. we're going to host a debate. And we're standing here in Washington where I can tell you the debate that we're going to have tonight does not happen elsewhere, right? And so what's the US Chamber of Commerce, bio, Ruth Akedeji from Harvard, and Grail Kerkorian from Doctors Without Borders are going to be on a stage tonight to actually debate the big questions on IP. And it matters, we were very excited to think about Washington DC as a home for the Global Congress because this debate does not happen, I can tell you. In this town, there are panel after panel after panel that have one side of the conversation. And the side that often many of us in the room represent stands up in the back and says, yes, but I have a question about your entire business model and all of the principles that it's based on. Well, tonight, we're going to get a chance to actually do that in person. And I hope that you all come, because it's going to be interactive. It's going to be interesting. And we actually need the voices of folks that are in this room to be in that room, too, because the four folks who are on stage are not going to be the only ones speaking. So it's 6 PM tonight at Georgetown University. One of the things that that does mean is that you're going to have to take some transportation. right? So everyone raise your hand. right? I promise to take transportation. No, you can stop. But right, it does mean that it's not in this room. It's also not in Georgetown, right? So let me do two things. You've got an email, right? So despite the fact that you are going to Georgetown University Law Center, if you go to Georgetown and ask around, you will not find the Law Center. It's next to Union Station on Capitol Hill. But what it does mean is that the fact that it's next to Capitol Hill means that we've already got RSVPs from folks from Capitol Hill. We've got staffers who are coming over from Capitol Hill to stand with us and sit with us and hear this debate. And it should be very interesting and robust. Directions are in your email. So thank you to everybody for being here. Thank you for putting together this Congress. Thank you for those of you that endured many, many emails back and forth about logistically placing your panels. Thank you to those of us who we dropped your panel and then found it again. All of that shows right, that this is put together on strings, but also on, um, on passion. And thinking about the work that went into this, it makes me inspired every day to think about what can happen. The next big ideas that we've got in access to medicine have to come here, because if they're not going to come here, if they're not coming from the various different venues, then we are in deep trouble, because the threats are very real, even to the access we've got today. But the opportunities are also incredible. And I think it's clearly mounting that uh, folks don't accept and are decreasingly accepting the model as we have it today. And so look forward to debating the model that we will have to come. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I think I'm going to start with my own history of the Global Congress because it will show, it will, it will, it, it will present you the the transformation. Like, like when my first Global Congress was in Brazil, I missed the one in DC. 
And I was an I was I was an access to medicines person attending all the access to medicines uh, sessions. And second congress was in in South Africa. I was I did like access to medicines and some copyright, especially enforcement like uh, sessions. And then the third uh, global congress it was in India. And Sean told me why don't you organize some sessions on trade? So I was doing a little bit of access to medicines. A copyright, and but mostly trade panels. And now, for my fourth global congress, I made it to the stage. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I am the I am the track leader for the digital trade track, and digital trade track is quite new. We are not like very crowded. We have a small group, so this year we're gonna try and see how it works. Because at the end of today, we all fight against the global in global information injustice. That's what I like about PGIP, like information justice program. We fight against the global uh, global information injustice, and it was medicines. It was or books, it was our music, now it's our data. And this all happens in, in, in trade agreements. So this week, we're gonna focus on, on uh, trade agreements and most of the digital provisions in trade agreements. And this track happens because of free people and I think I owe a big um, thanks for them. First of all, I have to acknowledge Sean for giving me the opportunity and encouraging me to, um, to, to uh, organize this track. But this wouldn't have been happened without the support of Melissa. Thank you very much, Melissa, for believing in me. And then, of course, my colleague, Peter, and my organization, Public Citizen, because I spent so much time <laughs> organizing this track. And we have, uh, we have few new faces. You're gonna see them around at the corridors. They are mostly digital rights activists, so they haven't attended the Global Congress before, go and say hi. And we have like few a few sessions, not that many as copyright or access to medicines, but our sessions are super fun, super interesting. For instance, today we have a panel on right to be forgotten. It's a big debate. We brought all these like big names and they're gonna be uh, discussing and debating the, the right to be forgotten, which which is very important for, for us, for, for all of us. And then we will have trade negotiation simulation. It will be super fun, I can assure you. And we first thought about closing it because we had these two days of training and we had like amazing 30 participants during our trainings. And it was the last, uh, last section of the training. And we said that, okay, let's do that like at American University. But I, I heard from a couple of people that they were really interested to come and watch the simulation. It will be really interesting. And if you are around uh, at 2 p.m., we are at the, this fancy courtroom, Weinstein, right? Yeah, Weinstein courtroom. Come and join us. It will be fun. And then tomorrow we have a big debate on trade. And we brought all these people like the DC policy elite. I'm going to call them as DC policy elite. And we're going to discuss what future holds for the trade agreements. But apart from that, we have all these sessions focusing on trade agreements in Asia Pacific, trade agreements in Latin America, trade like we have a panel on Brexit, for instance, like what's going to happen after Brexit, like UK trade agreements. And we have we have really, really important and interesting participants who are attending this conference for the first time. So I think it will be interesting for them to get to know you and learn from your experiences. As I said, we all fight against the information injustice. And we have, we have so much experience. I am still an access to medicines person. It's my, it's most, 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 um, my, one of my most, uh, most important projects. But I'm also doing digital trade, and I'm 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 um, I am trying to to connect the communities. So we should be we should be more connected to the digital rights activists, and hopefully we will learn from each other this week. And this track will will continue, and the next like next global congress. We will have more people. We will have more digital rights activists, with more trade activists joining us at the Global Congress. Thank you very much.
Good morning. I think I can make a quick transition here. Sean said I have only a couple of minutes. I have 36 slides, but I'll try to get through them quickly. <laughs> that is a joke. All right. All right, so much for the easy transition. So um, wonderful to be back here. Um, the, Global Congress, the, Glo the Global Congress has been very important to me over the years. Uh, I've really enjoyed the community that has emerged around it. Uh, it's also a great pleasure not to be responsible for a track. It makes it super easy to be involved in the preparation. <laughs> <laughs> but I have um, taken on the task of thinking about how we can make some collective statements as a Congress together. Uh, this is something we've considered important to the Congress over the years. Sean mentioned the Washington Declaration that came out of the first Congress. There were about a thousand signatories to that. Uh, it holds up remarkably well as a kind of framing statement for the work we're doing. Now, what we're doing this year is a bit different. So we've uh, deployed a tool called Polis, which is a bit like a, it's a collaborative survey tool where the survey is composed by people making statements and then voting agree or disagree on the statements of others. So you are all invited to participate in this. I strongly encourage you to do so. It's super easy and quick, and you can run through the statements very, very, very quickly. Uh, this is the, you should have received links to the, uh, to the sort of voting landing page earlier today. There's a, you should have all received an email providing a bit of an explanation and context for what this, this what we hope to achieve over the, next, over the next couple days with this. So this is the, just the way you interact with the Polis survey. You, um, vote agree or disagree on a statement like this. Uh, do I need to explain the monkey holds the copyright in this community? Probably not, right? But if you're, if you're curious, this is a, a monkey that was given the opportunity to play with a camera, took a picture of itself, and then and a, a long running, and I don't, know, I don't even know if it's fully settled, but there, was been, there have been years of copyright fights over who holds the copyright, or is there a copyright? Anyway, you'll have a chance to express your opinion on that. I'm going to vote. <laughs> I'm going to vote disagree. I don't think the monkey holds the copyright. And then it will show you the next statement in the queue. So you, right now there are around 90 statements in the queue. You then have an opportunity to add a new statement if you have a statement that you would like to make to the other members of the Congress on something that you, you find interesting or important. So it's relatively easy to make a consensus statement about things. Oh, we need more work on pick your problem. Most people will agree. Uh, give some thought to how you can make statements that are likely to reflect a diversity of opinion in this group. Because that's how Polis then interprets vote clustering. And Polis is doing some magic on the back end to, um, to, to organize the votes by affinities. And you can see the different clusters of uh, participants emerging. Sean registered back when we thought we might do this non-anonymously. So Sean's going to be bouncing around this. <laughs> but at the, at, at, you know, for now, or, or for, for the rest of the Congress, any participation is going to be anonymous. You can submit anonymously. You can vote anonymously. Your face will not appear in the little uh, visualization. But right now, Polis is identifying three main groups of opinion in this community. And I'll have a chance on Saturday to come back and try and interpret those results. Right now, they're quite complicated. Um, if you want to see the votes, there's also a link in that email to the kind of raw tabulated report that Polis is generating in real time as people vote. So it, it's quite fascinating. I think if you're on the fence about whether to fully invest in this, take a look at the results. And uh, see, you'll be able to see the kinds of statements that people have made. Some of them are just demographic statements. But many of the other ones are uh, you know, statements that get fairly deep into the weeds of IP policy. And I'd encourage you to submit more statements of that kind. Um, the, you know, the multiple, bar, the multiple bars here are, reflect the breakdown that Polis does of the different groups. So on the far left is the overall tabulation, you know, overall among all participants who agrees and disagrees. 
and then the bars to the right are the different groupings that Polis has identified. And those will continue to bounce around, I think. So this is what that looks like um, in the Polish vi Polis visualization that you also have access to. You can play with it. Um, you know, one of the things you can do with this, if you can find the person next to you, if you're a dot in the upper left quadrant, for example, and you can identify your intellectual property soulmate somewhere else in this Congress, if that person is very close, uh, those are, that's a person who's voted almost identically to you. Um, there's a lot of depth to this sort of back-end interface, and I'll be able to explain it, explain it in a little more depth on Saturday. But in the meantime, let me just encourage you to play. It's quick. You can run through these 90 existing statements in probably 15 minutes. I expect there to be more statements submitted over the next few days, and then there will be a couple days after the Congress where you can come back and uh, finish off the statements if you're so inclined. And then we'll publish out, again, an anonymized report that tries to make sense of the collective opinion of the Congress. Thank you. Okay, so um, that's the end of our opening. So it's the end of the beginning. Um, I have one announcement to make that's specific and one that's general. General announcement is that the printed schedules are uh, not the reference version. You need to look online because the schedules get updated as rooms get moved or adjusted. So please do look at the online CVENT schedule for room locations. And the uh, first notice on that one is that we moved to a larger room for uh, Professor So's session at lunch, ensuring sustainable access to antibiotics. So that will be in Grossman 1, which is this half of the room. So thank you very much, and our next session will start at 10.30 sharp. Thanks a lot.